I think we can get started. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the second presentation in this academic year's Databricks Tech and Career Talk series. I'm really glad that everyone could join us. I'm Drew Pollan, the Academic Director of MIDS here at the iSchool, and I'm pleased to introduce Chris Hoshino-Fish, who will lead the presentations and discussion today focused which is an optimized system for data management in the cloud. Uh, Chris is a lead solutions architect at Databricks and an active member of the performance subject matter expert group. Chris is a former principal consultant focused on data engineering, working with several Fortune 500 Databricks customers. Prior to Databricks, Chris worked uh, for an ad tech company as a data engineer, managing pipelines using Apache Spark for three and a half years. Chris has a BA in computational mathematics from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, welcome, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I just want uh, everybody in the audience to know that we're going to set aside um, a few minutes at the end, 10 minutes or so at the end of the presentation for questions. Uh, feel free to pose questions in the Q&A panel or in the chat. Um, we're also going to uh, try to address them during the presentation. So, uh, Chris, I'll try and jump in when I see a, a relevant question for you. Um, thanks again, Chris. Do you want to get started? Awesome. Thank you, Drew. Um, so uh, thanks for introducing me. Um, I have a, a bio slide that'll come up after this. And the topic of today's talk is a, a new product from Databricks specifically focused on um, data engineering and data management in the cloud. Um, and I'll kind of explain the, the motivation behind it, um, go through some of the features that it offers, and then we'll, we'll do a, a demo. Um, and I definitely want to um, field as many questions as come up. So um, definitely if you see something that's interesting and you wanna know more about it, please ask in the Q&A and we'll answer it. Um, so as mentioned, um, I'm a, a lead solutions architect at Databricks. Um, what that really means is that, you know, we're a software vendor. And so we, we sell a data platform uh, product to enterprises that want to do things with their data. Um, we kind of fall in the section of big data uh, items and specifically focus on managing large amounts of data um, in the cloud, in the public cloud. So in Azure Cloud, um, AWS, and GCP, uh, Google Cloud. And um, on, as a solutions architect, I work with the data engineering teams that are our customers to um, help them accomplish their actual data projects and get things working. Um, a lot of the times that means working on um, inside of Databricks and using the Databricks software, but there also involves, um, you know, we're interacting with all of their other data systems that are out there. So I've also gotten a lot of experience with databases, um, different types of databases, um, kind of NoSQL databases or document stores, those kinds of things, um, as well as learning a lot about uh, things on the hardware side as well. So it's been um, really valuable for me. I originally um, had got a degree in applied math from UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I'm also originally from Berkeley itself. So I, I, uh, I went to Berkeley High School, a slightly different uh, school in Berkeley. Um, and originally at, at Santa Cruz, um, data science was kind of becoming a hot thing in uh, you know, 2008, 2009. And I thought that that was really cool. I was really into the idea of building predictive models and being able to accurately predict things. Um, and then once I got into the industry and was working at an ad tech company as a data scientist, I quickly learned that I didn't actually enjoy building 100 models and 99 of them failed at what I was trying to do and only that 100th model actually worked. Um, I, I was kind of frustrated with that and at the same time we, we needed to kind of establish our source of truth and be able to actually rely on the data that was in our data lake, um, be able to manage the large amounts of data we are getting every day and be able to just run accurate analytics on it. Um, and so I kind of pivoted away from data science and doing the modeling and, and predictive part of things and focusing more on the um, uh, source of truth is how I describe it. Um, building out that source of truth, building a system that you can actually rely on and get reliable information from, um, especially as businesses scale up. 
And um, this has turned out to be the major problem that most enterprises are dealing with currently. Um, most businesses out there are trying to get to a state where they have accurate data and, and reliable data that functions at large scales. Um, and then once you actually have that source of truth and you have data that you can rely on, then you can start building out um, more advanced algorithms, more advanced analytics and start being able to actually build predictive things. Um, but you first have to establish that baseline and that source of truth. And that's, that's really where data engineering um, comes into play. So I, I tend to classify data engineering as the things you are doing um, to set up the systems, kind of the systems engineering that you need to do to be able to uh, actually build projects that leverage data. So hopefully that um, is kind of meaningful to the, the audience out there, um, especially in your own background and, and as you're looking ahead. Um, so I'll kind of breeze through this. This is a little bit of architecture, a little bit of technology. Um, the Databricks platform overall is kind of uh, the, the data ecosystem is building out this new paradigm where for the past kind of 30, 40 years, you've had these databases that have existed and you know they were they've been um, kind of working in industry for upwards of 40 years. So databases have developed all of these advanced features, um, had decades of research applied to them, tons of optimizations. Um, and they they know exactly what businesses are trying to do with their data because they've been in the industry for so long. Um, and in particular, they're well optimized for certain types of data access. Um, they're really designed very well for structured data, tabular data, um, you know, essentially doing Excel functions, but at a larger scale and faster. Um, and then in the kind of the big data world, we have this idea of a data lake. And, um, you know, I think companies like Google, um, Facebook, these other big data companies, um, they've, you know, been able to benefit a lot from being able to capture um, less structured data. So rather than just trying to count the number of things you sold yesterday, these companies are focused on things like, I want to index all the web pages in the world, or I want to be able to, um, you know, index people uh, in, in Facebook's case. Um, and so uh, the data lake kind of filled this gap where Databases were designed for this really structured data. Um, they were designed for really specific uh, types of questions, analytical questions like how many things did I sell yesterday? And over in the data lake, we have things like we can store videos, we can store text, and we have um, processing engines that can actually do things with those. Um, and so we want to, there's benefits to both of these systems. And the, the technology is kind of getting to the point where um, we're seeing the advent of this paradigm we're labeling the lake house. And the lake house is basically taking the high performance aspects of a database, um, you know, where, where databases can handle millisecond latency, um, they can handle thousands of concurrent transactions all at the same time. And then on the, the data lake side, we can bring our own algorithms um, we can interact with it with more advanced um, software libraries, Python libraries, use things like TensorFlow or PyTorch on that data. And we want to actually be able to combine both of these into the same system. So we'd like to have just a, a single source of truth for all of our data and be able to leverage some kind of query engine that can both um, handle unstructured data as well as structured data be very fast for answering simple questions like how many things did I sell yesterday, as well as being able to serve up um, more complex data, like being able to load videos or images and then process those with machine learning models. So this talk is gonna focus specifically on the data engineering aspect of things. And this really means ingesting data from various data sources, processing it into a format that can be accessed by different engines, and then exposing that data to um, the next step in the pipeline or the actual use case that you have. And these use cases, again, they can be simple, like counting things, or they can be more advanced, like I want to uh, train a machine learning model on this data. 
Yeah, and we will um, we'll definitely share the slides after this. Um, so these are some kind of um, key differentiators that, that businesses are thinking about in terms of what they need out of a, a data system. I, I won't hit on all of these because we'll cover some of them in the slides later on. Um, but there's a few important things here where um, the pipelines that you build need to be scheduled and managed in some kind of way. Um, so you can't just write code that transformed data once. You need to be able to automate that and actually deploy these pipelines and have them run on a consistent basis. There's things around observability, like when something goes wrong or if the data doesn't look right, you need to be able to investigate and figure out what's been happening. Um, and then this one is of particular interest. Data quality is a um, hot topic in the data industry right now. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of early stage startups and open source projects that are springing ar up around to, to focus on monitoring data quality. And um, we'll, I'll touch on that and, and where Databricks kind of fits in. But in particular, in the past, um, databases have good support for like basic data quality monitoring, um, where they can uh, do things like monitor if all of a sudden there's a bunch of empty data that's being sent to a database. Um, but with the advent of kind of machine learning models and, and uh, the idea of featureization of data, where you, you build out more complex features out of the raw data that's coming in, there's a need to monitor the data quality and answer questions like, how accurate is my data? Um, how complete is my data? Do I have all of it? Um, you know, what is a, a baseline accuracy that I should be able to rely on? And how should I be monitoring that? Um, so these are the kinds of questions where you, you see this as kind of like a maturity thing in the, um, in the industry, where now that we've kind of gotten to a point where we can query the data and actually access the large amounts of data we have, the first thing somebody's going to do when they start looking at the data is they're going to say, hey, this data looks wrong. Um, and so being able to monitor data quality is very important. Delta Live Tables itself is essentially a, um, a client library combined with a orchestration and um, pipeline running uh, uh, entity that exists. So it's, it's both a library where you write code in a particular way, and then you submit that code to a system that's going to take that code and actually deploy it into data pipelines. Um, that might sound kind of basic when I describe it that way, but if you contrast this with what exists today in the world of big data, um, it, that's actually doing a lot compared to existing systems, where um, with existing systems, you have to write all the code that uh, processes all your data, but then you also have to figure out how to deploy a system that's going to process it. Um, and in the world of big data, we, we use the term cluster a lot, uh, a cluster of compute machines or a cluster of um, uh, servers that can be used to process your data. So Delta Live Tables is building on top of uh, existing open source projects of Apache Spark, um, Delta Lake, and Structured Streaming. Um, and Apache Spark, right, is the uh, project that came out of UC Berkeley. Um, and is, was originally the foundation of the Databricks company. And then Delta Lake is a, a storage format that Databricks developed um, for our customers. And after a couple of years of um, building it out and scaling it, we then open sourced it and donated it to the Linux Foundation. Live tables um, as well, we'll, we'll probably end up open sourcing it in some way in the future. Um, and for now, we've been kind of working on it for the last year and a half, two years um, internally and with our customers to actually make sure that it's a, a scalable, mature product that functions well. Um, the, the way you actually write code in Delta Live Tables, there's two APIs. There's a SQL API and a Python API. Um, this is nice because we're... Um, building a bunch of functionality on the SQL side that doesn't necessarily exist in existing SQL systems. And then we're also uh, still having access to a more advanced API in Python, where you can pull in Python libraries, kind of do arbitrary processing, 
um, do whatever you want to the data essentially, um, but still take advantage of this structured data processing engine. One of the benefits of Delta Live Tables is that the way the API is designed, it allows you to get more feedback earlier on in the development process. So as you're developing your data pipelines, um, you can ensure certain data quality aspects, data validation aspects, as well as get feed, more immediate feedback on um, syntax checking and making sure that your data pipeline will actually run correctly. Um, contrasting this with kind of the existing way of developing Spark pipelines, you'd have to develop all of your code and then deploy the pipeline in order to test if it's actually going to succeed or fail on your data. Specifically, um, specific, this is somewhat specific to the cloud, but also just a general problem across the board. Um, the, the storage layers themselves care both about how much data you have, but also uh, how many objects you're actually storing that data in. Um, so all of the, the public clouds offer uh, some kind of object storage, which is essentially a service on top of their hard drives. Um, that does things like data replication and data center failover and those kinds of things. So when you upload data into these object stores, um, you get a bunch of benefits over just writing files to a hard drive. Um, you're getting much higher uptime, much higher scalability, and it's extremely, extremely cheap. Um, however, there's kind of these uh, trade-offs where it doesn't have exactly the same performance capabilities that a single hard drive is going to have. And the cloud storages are specifically limited in a couple um, features where if you have hundreds of millions of files stored on object storage, it's going to start to be slower and slower to do things like list how many files you actually have. Databricks works around this as a, a data processing engine. You know, we, we have plenty of customers who are going to upload hundreds of millions of files, um, receive them programmatically from systems that are automatically generating these files. Um, and so in order to work around the, the scale limitations of the object stores, we developed this feature call that we call the auto loader, um, where it, it leverages a bunch of um, uh, different layers where it's able to um, actively checkpoint what data it's already processed. Um, this enables us to, to incrementally process all of the data as it arrives. So rather than having to constantly reload data that we've already processed, we're able to automatically checkpoint what's already been happening, um, only process net new data, and also kind of work around the limitations of object storage to be able to deliver good performance for loading this data. Um, things that come up a lot in, in actual businesses um, are things like being able to handle malformed data. Um, this is a very common problem where either you have a, a system that's malfunctioning or um, some data transportation methods are susceptible to problems with internet connectivity. So it's always possible that you end up with bad data, partial data, uh, malformed data. Um, so we have some kind of built-in features that, that let you automatically kind of quarantine data that can't be processed, but keep your main pipeline up and running. Um, and then the other one is kind of around um, evolution of data. So over time, as you're running data systems, it's very easy for um, data producers to start altering the type of data that they're producing or to change the structure of that data. And so being able to automatically evolve the schema of the, the place where you're loading this data into becomes really important. Um, otherwise, it requires a lot of manual intervention from data engineers. Um, change data capture, I, I kind of uh, will joke all the time that um, most businesses just need to update data. So, you know, you have a customer and you want to know how many times they logged in to Netflix. In order to do that, you're going to have a customer ID and you're going to constantly add to some counter every time that they log back in. And so you, you need to be able to actually update that data. 
Um, and then there are other things that are a little more um, like regulatory in nature, things like GDPR or um, California's uh, CCPA, I think it is, where um, you, know, you have the right to be deleted. And so this has forced all of these businesses to actually build into their systems the ability to go in and do um, pointed deletes from their data systems. Um, so kind of all businesses almost across the board have a need to be able to do updates of some kind. And with this is already possible with, um, with Spark and Delta Lake, but specifically in live tables, we have the opportunity to build a slightly higher level system that can do more automatically for the data engineers. So uh, in live tables, we've um, built it in a way where it can automatically figure out the correct order to apply your updates in. So it, it keeps track of um, you know, when events are actually coming in and the system can automatically figure out if a late event should be processed into the table or should be skipped. Um, and then it also, it has support for kind of all the different types of actions that you need to do, whether that's deleting data, um, overriding data or updating it in place. And uh, this actually ends up covering, you know, most use cases, it turns out. Um, this one is something that becomes particularly important here in the cloud. Um, so, you know, in the public clouds, the huge benefit of using the clouds is that you pay for what you use rather than buying hardware and then trying to figure out how you can get your money's worth out of it. Um, but this in turn brings um, kind of new um, requirements from the businesses that are, are using these cloud infrastructures. So because we're paying for everything by the second, um, every second that you're not using a machine, but you're still paying for it becomes really important. Um, so Databricks uh, for our, our data processing clusters offers this idea of auto scaling, where we can uh, scale out the cluster based on how much data there is to process. Um, with live tables, we have a bunch of additional information that we're monitoring about the data pipelines. And we're able to use this additional information to build more advanced auto scaling. Um, and kind of the, the ideal state that all uh, data engineers and data practitioners really want is they want kind of like to forget about clusters altogether, never have to worry about how many machines they might need to process their data. Instead, just point the system at the data that needs to be processed and let the system figure out based on how much data there is, um, how big a, a machine or how many machines you need to actually process it. Um, so we, are, we have this kind of new auto scaling algorithm that takes advantage of all these different data pieces that we're capturing. Um, and in particular, what we found is there's a few um, key features that are really important for this algorithm to work well. Um, so what we do is we look ahead into the incoming data. So we look at the backlog of data. Um, and this means that if you're using something like a streaming data source, um, something like uh, Kafka or, or Pulsar, um, there will be information about how much data is waiting to be processed there. Or if you're loading a set of files from um, object storage, you know, we're gonna be able to see how many files there are uh, waiting to be processed. So that lets us kind of um, proactively scale up the cluster based on the incoming data volumes. Um, and then at the same time, we uh, closely monitor the metrics on the cluster itself. So we monitor things like CPU utilization, uh, memory utilization, those kinds of things, and then identify when um, you know, utilization is going down and there's no pending backlog to be processed. And we can start uh, removing machines from the cluster and scaling it down. If long term, um, this is going to get us to a state where we can actually do that um, kind of serverless uh, processing where you don't have to decide ahead of time how many potential machines you might need. Instead, we'll just look at how much data there is to process and then decide what the cluster size needs to be for you.
The other thing is there are a bunch of um, maintenance actions that you need to do um, in order to, to store data in object storage and still be able to have performant um, interactions with it. So as you're querying the data, um, as you're loading it to, to process models on it or, or load it into TensorFlow or any of those things, there's a bunch of optimizations that we're actually doing behind the scenes to automatically make those tables very performant. Um, and this is again, kind of an evolution of the current state of data engineering, where there's a lot of manual data engineering that needs to be done in order to tune these tables to be performant for the use cases that actually exist. So with live tables, we're able to do more automatically for the data engineer. And this starts to bring the big data world more into parity with what we had um, in small data on databases where databases are already offering this higher level table abstraction and underneath the database is handling all of the actual files and data structures that make up those tables. Um, so with live tables, um, and this is kind of a, a common theme of Databricks in general, a lot of times we're not actually inventing anything new at all. Instead, it's the um, place and the way that we're implementing it that is novel. Um, so kind of the, the large data scale and then running these things in the cloud um, just means that there is kind of more effort involved to take these same principles of databases and bring them into the modern infrastructure and modern ecosystem. Um, and then this is, uh, so um, this, this kind of falls under both DevOps and um, uh, continuous integration or continuous deployment um, categories. Um, you know, in all software, there's this idea of testing your software uh, before you deploy it to your customers. Um, and in software, uh, you know, there's concepts of unit testing and things like integration testing. Um, and in the data world, there is now kind of this new type of testing that is kind of data, data testing, data unit testing, data integration testing, um, where it's not enough to just write your code that processes data. You also need to test that code on real data in order to be sure that this code is going to succeed when you, you do deploy it to production and run it. Um, so there's a, a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, and you know when you're doing things locally, uh, you're probably testing on small amounts of data. You might be testing on your laptop or your desktop. Um, and that's not gonna fully replicate your production environment. Um, and so, you know, it, good software testing principles means that we should be testing all of our software in as close to a real life imitation of our actual production environment as possible. And so in the big data world, what this really means is that we're going to need to deploy test versions of our pipelines um, out into, you know, if you're running the cloud, out into the cloud and be able to test if my pipeline is going to run on a non-trivial amount of data. So I can test my pipeline locally on my laptop. I can test it on, you know, a gigabyte of data. But if it's going to process one terabyte of data every day, that one gigabyte test is really not going to be enough to make sure that my pipeline scales. Um, with live tables and, and in Databricks, there's uh, this paradigm where you can both leverage proper um, software testing principles and software development principles, leverage things like Git repos, and then still be able to pull them in to your actual production workspaces and then run those test pipelines against real data. Um, so this is kind of simplifying the ability to do good testing of your data pipelines and have more confidence that when you do deploy them that they're gonna run successfully. Then the last thing that becomes really important is orchestration of data pipelines. Um, so, if, you know, if I wanna run my data pipeline all the time, that's fairly straightforward. I just need to, you know, turn it on and it'll be running all the time. But if instead, more realistically, um, 
there aren't that many organizations that are at a point where they can really uh, monetarily benefit from real-time data. Um, so everybody would prefer to have real-time data, but the reality is that, you know, if you're only gonna be updating reports once a day, there's not that much financial benefit to an organization to develop a real-time data system. Um, and there is gonna be a significant amount of cost. And the, the, you know, the, the trade-off that I'll kind of describe is um, the analogy I like to use is like, most people are best off driving a Toyota Corolla that is gonna get, you know, 55 miles per gallon, but is only gonna go 60 miles an hour. Um, and there are some circumstances where you might wanna actually spend the millions of dollars to develop a Formula One race car. Um, but very few people are gonna be able to drive that race car. Uh, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to build it and operate it. And so you have to kind of trade these off where um, as you move towards more real time, things are gonna get more and more expensive. Um, most organizations are gonna benefit the most from things like daily or hourly or you know, 10 minute type of intervals for processing their data. And so you're gonna need some kind of orchestration piece that will be able to trigger those flows on whatever frequency you need them triggered on. Um, in the Databricks product, we offer a orchestrator that we call multitask jobs, which is able to orchestrate multiple different tasks in, um, in your data pipelines. And so I'll, I'll talk about how this kind of integrates with Delta Live tables and, and how it actually fits into accomplishing things with your data. So I wanna start by um, showing you a simple data pipeline here. And um, Delta Live Tables in particular is in this category of products um, called data flow uh, products. And what a data flow product does is it is more specifically tailored to running data pipelines. Um, and it is aware of where the data is flowing in the data pipeline. Um, and that this is why the category is data flow products. So what Live Tables is going to do is it's going to take all of my code that processes my data, understand all of the different data sources that I'm loading, and understand how they relate to each other. It's also going to know what order my pipeline needs to process things in. So I can give it uh, all of my transformations that are going between these different stages, and it's going to know which ones can happen in parallel and which ones need to be run in a specific order. So each of these boxes represents a particular data table in my data lake. Um, at the beginning, I'm ingesting a bunch of JSON files that I've, I've got on object storage. Um, and then uh, this is kind of a, a labeling convention that Databricks and other companies uses where you have this idea of uh, incrementally refining your data and improving it. Um, we kind of call the, the bronze, silver, gold medallion paradigm. Um, and at the bronze layer, this is going to be kind of raw data. Um, and, and raw data means different things to different people in an organization. Um, if you're the, the core data engineer who's interacting with the source systems, your idea of raw data might be things like a stream of binary data. If you're processing video data, um, it might mean a whole bunch of images that you're being fed directly. It could mean um, streaming data coming in through Kafka or um, JSON data or website data. Um, but if you're like a business analyst or if you're a data scientist, your idea uh, of raw data may be um, further along the pipeline. Um, so if you're a business analyst, your idea of raw data might just mean unaggregated data. And you might be used to only interacting with um, daily summaries of that data. Um, and if you're a data scientist, you might be used to interacting with feature tables where the data has already been parsed out and processed in a few different ways, featureized so that it's already ready to go for whatever um, uh, machine learning engine you're trying to process that data with. Live tables is really focused on the 
loading your data from the initial sources and then putting it out there into the data lake so that it can be picked up for whatever downstream actions you might have. And I'll, I'll show you a particular example of um, um, doing some model training later on. I mentioned data quality earlier as well. And so um, in addition to just defining uh, the data tables and where data needs to go in this pipeline, I can also define some rules on my data and say what, uh, what type of expectations I want to set on these data pipelines. The, the expectations that um, we currently support are things like, um, I, they're kind of row-wise expectations. So you can check for a particular column, um, is the data valid or is the data uh, present? You know, is, it, is this column empty? Um, I can do things like validate. Um, here I have a bunch of expectations that are validating things like, are my currency codes real currencies? Are my country codes real countries? Um, those kinds of things. And then something that we are uh, currently working on is being able to support more um, summary level expectations. So being able to do things like, uh, I wanna track a rolling average of the um, number of nulls that are coming out of a particular data source. And maybe I wanna say, you know, if the number of nulls goes up more than two standard deviations away from the average, I'd like to be alerted because I think that something's gone horribly wrong with my pipeline. Um, and then the way that we're kind of interacting with these data quality um, rules is giving users different actions that they can take with data quality. So their user, our users are able to um, drop bad data as well as quarantine bad data um, so that they can potentially repair that bad data and processes on, process it process it on later. Um, it turns out when we talked to most customers, they said that they're not allowed to get rid of data they don't like, and they do have to deal with it at some point in the future. Um, so most, most, in, most businesses are interested in this idea of quarantining bad data and trying to figure out how to repair it or how to deal with it later on. And then this is also really common in feature engineering pipelines where, you know, different models or, or uh, different algorithms, you know, can't deal with null values or only want complete records, um, depending on the, the type of algorithm you're running, the type of framework you're using, you may or may not be able to deal with um, sparser data or less complete data. And so these expectations kind of serve as a way for you to both monitor that data quality and data completeness as well as do uh, take certain actions on the result of that. Um, and in the, in the slides, I mentioned some of the other frameworks. Um, this plays really nicely with other tools that are popping up around data quality where most of the open source projects are just focused on the um, validation side of things. So they'll kind of uh, come in and once data has been written, to a place, they'll come in and validate whether or not that data uh, meets your rules. Um, so with, because Databricks is the actual data processing engine, we're able to apply these data quality rules in the pipeline itself um, and actually help customers prevent bad data from making it downstream. One, one way that this works really well and integrates well with, um, you know, kind of like the overall end-to-end -end goals that, that businesses really have, you know, most of the time writing data into your data lake is not the end of the process. Usually it's actually the beginning. Usually there's some thing that you're trying to do with your data. And that thing might be, you know, just, I just want to count how many things I sold yesterday, or it might be more advanced, like, uh, I got new data yesterday and I want to retrain my model on that new data. So this is where the orchestration piece uh, comes into play. And so this, this graph looks kind of similar to um, the page we were just on. Um, and the difference is that this, this pipeline is specifically a data processing pipeline. So each of these badges here is a table of data. And once this pipeline has completed, 
I am positive that uh, data has been processed and loaded. All of the new data that I got since the last time I ran this pipeline has been processed into all my tables. And now I'm safe to go and run um, whatever downstream action I actually wanted to do with my data. And so in this example, uh, this pi that pipeline, that data pipeline is represented here on this badge. And then once I've written out data into my feature tables, I have a dependent action that's gonna um, run a model train notebook against this data. And I think I can click out into this actually. Um, and so if I go, uh, I believe, let's see, I should be able to pull this up as well. So if I go and look at, um, this pipeline, sorry. This particular pipeline uh, loads some data and then um, does some transformations and then featureizes the data into a, uh, a male feature table and a female feature table. Um, and then once that happens, I know that uh, once this pipeline completes, that data has all the new data has been loaded. It's been incrementally processed throughout this pipeline and then written out into these two uh, feature tables. And now the data has been written into my two feature tables, I can trigger uh, this model train to go back and actually um, retrain my model against the new data. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the, the model itself, um, this, this, I can share these notebooks for sure. This ends up processing um, some k-mean stuff into some clustering algorithms. Um, and so this works really well um, for a lot of data scientists out there in the industry, especially because data science pipelines are probably not gonna run every day. You know, if you're uh, collecting new data that is being tracked, or if you're getting results from a model deployment, um, you may not have a high enough volume of data to justify running these pipelines 24 seven. Um, so instead you can kind of rely on the incremental processing nature of, um, of Spark and live tables, be able to trigger this pipeline once a week or once a day, or even once a month, if you're, um, this model is just not very high priority. Um, and so you can trigger this pipeline however often you actually need to ingest new data and then rerun your model training automatically and see if the, the model improves or not. This kind of represents more of an end-to-end -end, um, flow where this incorporates kind of the, the business use case for the actual data. What is the thing I wanna do with my data once I've ingested it? And it shows how you can hand off the data processing the ingestion and loading into your systems to some other system like Delta Live Tables. And then the, the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, the kind of metadata that Live Tables is capturing about these systems. So one of the other um, things that is kind of difficult in the big data world and, and really has always been difficult in software engineering in general, is the idea of uh, observability and monitoring. Um, and, and one of my coworkers recently showed me a really good definition and of the distinction between these two things. Um, observability is the system's ability to be observed. So it's, uh, if I build a software application and I have no way to tell if it's running or not, that means that my system lacks observability features. Monitoring is what you actually do with that observed data. So if I'm uh, observing a application I just launched and I wanna create a monitoring dashboard that tells me if my application is up or not, um, this is the kind of distinction between observability and monitoring. Monitoring is what you do with the data and observability is your ability to ask the system questions and figure out if you can monitor it or not. So in historically in these data pipelines, it's been a real big burden to actually um, set up observability. 
This is something that is kind of always an afterthought, no matter what, where um, uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, we don't remember to build observability into systems until there's some problem that we can't answer. Um, and so, you know, it's like, oh, it, is my pipeline falling behind? Is it keeping up with the data I'm processing? If I didn't remember to set up observability on that pipeline, I may not be able to answer that question at all. And I'll have to deploy a whole new version of the pipeline that has that observability built in. So with live tables, we wanna build this observability in automatically and capture all of the relevant data that people are interested in monitoring for their data pipelines. And in particular, there's um, the data quality aspect becomes really interesting because um, it is not just monitoring the, the data pipeline and whether or not the pipeline is processing data, but answering more advanced questions like, is my data accurate? Is my data valid? Is my data you know, totally out of whack and I need to go bug whoever is producing that data? Um, so being able to, to both historically answer all of these questions, but also do things like do meta-analysis becomes really powerful. Um, and in particular, one of the really nice ways that you can do a meta analysis about your pipeline is you can monitor specific data sources in your pipeline. Um, so in my example pipeline, I had a bunch of JSON files that were being populated, um, you know, in theory by some machine out there. So maybe you have a, a, a monitoring device, you know, maybe you work at a, a oil company and you're monitoring sensors that are coming off of the, the actual oil refineries or something like that. Um, and all of a sudden, one of these sensors is producing a lot more um, incomplete data than it used to in the past. Um, this type of monitoring lets you actually say, oh, I need to send somebody out there and have them investigate this sensor that's producing data because all of a sudden it's producing a ton of invalid data. Answering these type of questions have historically required a lot of engineering effort to build all of these different pieces into the systems that are, are running these things. Um, and so by building this observability directly into Delta Live Tables, we're kind of providing um, out of the box uh, metrics that you can use to historically analyze how your pipeline has been behaving in the past and how these different data sources have been changing. Um, and I always joke here that this makes it pretty clear that it is probably fake data because it always has the exact same amount of data and it's either 1% clean or 99% clean. And that doesn't sound very realistic. Um, Drew, I just wanted to do a quick time check. Do we have, um, do we have 10 more minutes or, or were we wrapping up at 620? Yeah, no, we have we have 10 more minutes left and, um, you know, we can save just even a couple minutes at the end to see if anybody has any questions. And just a reminder, if anybody in the audience does have a question, um, please, uh, please, please type it in the Q&A or the, or the chat box and we can we can get to it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so honestly, this was uh, the majority of the content that I wanted to cover. Um, if it is, um, I think I could go through code, but this is probably only meaningful if you have um, experience with Apache Spark or, um, or Databricks in general. Um, the, the, the code itself is designed to be um, a kind of a lightweight evolution of the open source Apache Spark code. Um, and long-term, we do plan to figure out how to kind of open source this. So this would be both available locally for your own um, local projects, as well as um, being able to deploy it in other open source systems. Um, so, you know, if there ain't questions out there, definitely happy to answer them. Um, and if not, I can maybe give you a few minutes back. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, if anybody does have questions, um, like I said, you can either type them in or you could even raise your hand and I will actually um, speak with Chris. Uh, 
Uh, that is a great question. Um, so on the so live tables is currently in a kind of a weird state um, that we are calling a gated public preview. So the product is uh, like publicly announced and all of those things. And um, the only difference is just that we're still we still want to talk to every customer that's using it. Um, so you basically have to set up a meeting with me to get it enabled. That's that's the only thing. Um, but this is publicly publicly announced, um, and it's available for anybody to try out. So there's there's no restrictions on that. Yeah, observability. Um, observability is is a, a big thing in general um, for kind of all data processing systems. And there's there's tons of articles out there that specifically focus on observability. Um, let me let me see if I can pull one up. Um, there's definitely a few. And then on top of that, there's observability of both the um, kind of the, the system itself. So being able to monitor the, um, the, you know, monitor the machines that are processing your data, being able to um, monitor the, the hardware and stuff. But there's also observability of like, um, my end-to-end -end data pipelines, things like, um, you know, data is being sent from one, one producer machine, it's being sent through several systems, and then it eventually lands somewhere, being able to monitor end-to-end -end, um, the, the overall pipeline processing and your, your whole thing. There was, um, I'm trying to find it, there was a really good, um, blog from Airbnb recently that would kind of talk through their principles of um, data monitoring. I want to find that for you guys. Yeah, so this is a this was a recent blog post, not that recent, I guess. Pandemic time is weird. A year and a half ago, um, that kind of went through Airbnb's approach to data quality monitoring, and um, they they kind of established these five principles, which are are pretty important for any organization that's larger than like twenty people. Um, you know, like. A lot of times data can come stale. So you need like clear ownership of data. You need to know who to ask about what's wrong with the data. Um, being able to define SLAs and track whether or not you're meeting them um, and then see if you can improve them. This is this is a, a like a critical thing that oftentimes gets defined too late in the data engineering project. Um, establishing best practices and making sure that they're commonly used across the org. This one is more of like a culture problem, but it's really tough to build out. Um, and, and maybe you guys know this all too well, engineers don't always like to collaborate with each other. Um, and then, uh, especially, I think this came out of them going public. Um, at a certain point, your data, you, you do you know face penalties if you're incorrect about your data. And so if you're in a regulated industry like healthcare or something like that, or if you're a public company, you know, there are going to be consequences if your data is not being managed properly. And so this, this is something that is, uh, becomes more and more important as your project gets more serious. Um, and then as, you're, as more people interact with your data, you need better documentation and um, the idea of data discoverability. So, you know, and, and especially if you're like an amateur data scientist, you probably know this really well, like you go to download a Kaggle data set and you're sort of like, what, what did I just download? What is this data? Um, so the, especially at, or, at enterprises, this becomes a even bigger problem. And um, especially as people you know, leave companies, this can be a huge problem. So I really like this article. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So um, we haven't made any firm plans about open source. We just know that we do want to open source everything we build at some point. Um, this is a uh, this is something like these are my personal opinions, but um, you know, open sourcing software should be like it should be something that doesn't work very well. It should be something that's mature and really useful as proprietary software. I'm kind of of the opinion that if nobody's paying for your software, 
it still may not be worth anything if it's free either. Um, so we try to uh, only open source like mature software that is actually functional, works really well, and that we we know our users will have a good experience with. Um, Live tables is especially complicated because it is a higher level service than Spark. So the way to open source it is more complicated, but we, we are trying to figure those things out. Yeah, model monitoring, that's a great, um, yeah, so like live tables, the data quality aspects can really help with data drift. Um, and then that can, you know, that's like a big component of model drift and, and model monitoring. Um, so I, we think that um, because live tables is processing the data side of things, live tables, the, the data quality aspects are a really good way to detect data drift and monitor it. And then that can influence how you're managing your model monitoring and maybe help uh, influence um, you know, when you know that you need to start building new models because the data has drifted so far from your original features. Yeah, event-driven. So this is a big thing. Um, yeah, so event-driven is becoming more and more popular where you know, rather than having to run the pipeline all the time, I want to have the the pipeline just trigger whenever new data appears. Um, so kind of in our, our auto scaling, um, the new auto scaling that we've implemented in live tables allows us to move towards more of a serverless implementation for the compute layer. And we're hoping that eventually data engineers can start forgetting about the compute altogether. So you can start stop worrying about what compute you need to use, which instance types you need to use, all of those things. Instead, we plan to actually um, build our own uh, uh, predictive models that will be able to predict based on your workload, what's the best hardware to run it on and how to scale that cluster. Um, and as, as part of that, we wanna get to a place where we can be uh, have these event-driven pipelines where you don't have to worry about the compute and you're not really being charged for the compute. Instead, you're being charged for the data that's being processed and it gets processed as it comes in. That's definitely the dream, but I would say the industry is probably one to two years away from realizing that. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your thoughts, your experience with us, uh, um, and for walking through and demonstrating some of the great things that you can do with, um, with Delta Live Tables. Uh, with us today. Um, uh, thanks so much, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you all. I also want to thank um, Databricks for hosting this lecture series uh, and look out for the next in the series, which is planned for later this term. Um, thanks to Tia Foss and to Rob Reed for organizing the series. And uh, thanks to Gary Morphy Lam for Zoom support. And thanks uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, the recording of the presentation is going to be posted on the event page of the iSchool site probably in the next week or two. And uh, as Chris said, I think we're going to be able to get a, a copy of um, slides posted there as well. Um, thanks again, everyone. Hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>